Let's pray, y'all. It's time to get started. Father, we thank you so much for your love. And Lord, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for the lesson this morning. Lord, we just thank you for everything you do for us. And thank you for keeping us safe today, Lord. Just be with us tonight. Lord, just may this night be a blessing to us, Father, as we hear your word and sing your songs, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, good evening. Going over the announcements real quick. Uh, do not forget outreach tomorrow night. We'll be going out tomorrow night. It's normally our prayer night, but since next week is Friends Day, and some people are going to have to be hunting friends, we're going to kind of use it for outreach. <laughs> so if you want to come up here and write some cards, you know, to members that hadn't been here for a long time, We'll be able to do that also. Uh, just try to make a great day out of next weekend. Next Sunday's going to be a, a good, good day. So, uh, Then concealed carry class is filling up real quick. If you want to be a part of that, you need to talk to Brother Mike. If you sign up early, it's only $50. And that you can get your license. They'll do all the stuff, the shooting and everything else. Or you can renew it. If it's time for you to renew, that'll be a certificate so you can renew it. The other update, uh, be praying for our revival coming up this fall. It's going, it's going to be an exciting time that we can work with our sister churches and move around a little bit and hear some other churches. I know that our church's music is going to outshine them all but we get to hear some of theirs also. And they can be jealous of us. Brother Whalen, it's your turn. All right. Let's take your hymnal, 52. Page 52 in your hymnal. And when you got it, stand up. 52. Let's sing it together. He leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words with heavenly comfort brought. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me by his own hand. Faithful Father, I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Sometimes mid scenes of deepest gloom, sometimes where Eden flowers bloom. By water still or troubled sea, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, his own hands he leadeth me. His faithful father I would be, by his hands he leadeth me. Lord, I would clasp thy hand in mine, nor ever murmur, nor I, where Lord I see, still tis thy hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, his own hands he leadeth me. His faithful father I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. And when my task on earth is done, when by thy grace of victory's won, 
in death's cold wave I will not flee since God through Jordan leadeth me he leadeth me he leadeth me by his own hands he leadeth me his faithful father I would be for by his Now turn to 61. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures feed us. For our... Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast bought us, sign we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast bought us, sign on the last. Early let us seek your favor, early let us do thy will. Blessed Lord and only Savior, Will thy love our pump be filled? Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, loved us still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast loved us, love us still. Y'all have a seat. And he had a smirk on his face. Do you ever wonder what runs through that big mind that he is, that big head? No, I'm so oh, me. <laughs> There's a lot of room for stuff to run around in there, isn't it? You feel the love? <laughs> All right. Prayer time in our church tonight. Good crowd here tonight. I think this may be the most we've had on a Sunday night in a while. For those sitting over by themselves, I don't know why they don't like the rest of us. Been getting on them too hard? Okay. And poor little girls sitting back there, they don't like us. They don't want to be around us. It's going to inspire them. Yeah. Brother Ray. Brother Ray. Amen. Probably a lot of you would say that. Amen for Odie. Amen. 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 Yes, ma'am. Linda Gale. Great encourager. Who else? Who else? Can I have three? No, you get one. You can't name everybody in the church. Go ahead, Todd. Well, you can't say everybody. I'll pick one person. <laughs> All right, Mama. Um, Kathy, for one, and Linda Gale and Linda Jean bringing me a plate the other day when I wasn't home uh, meant a lot to me because in Kathy, what she does for this church, she really inspires me. So those three ladies really. Okay, thank you. Let me tell you who I inspires me. This old guy right here that I pick on inspires me. Because if your back was in the shape of his back, most of us would be sitting at home. 
I can't go. I can't be at church. I want to say Laura back here. She's come in and although she was old to the church and now she's new to the church, but with all the health stuff that she's been going through, she just, her and Todd both just kept on trucking and yet she's just coming here. They've gotten busy and now she's taking over with the children's department. I just, I'm inspired by her. Great. Amen. Go ahead. Amen. Amen. Encourage somebody. Tell somebody that they inspire you. Who you who else wants to pick somebody? Who wants to tell somebody? Brother Matt. Amen. Amen. Uh huh. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Who else? Yeah. Amen. Look around, Lisa. Amen. Who else wants to inspire somebody? Danny? Amen. Yeah. And right now he's taking on the headaches of the financial stuff and didn't really need that right now in his life, I'm sure. And he does our financial stuff for Open Door Missions. Uh, he just donates his time for that, and I really appreciate that. Yes, ma'am, Linda. Yeah. Amen. I would be more encouraged by Karen if the meals that she's always got pictures of on Facebook on the stove, I got invited over to eat some of them, you know. Amen. Amen. All right. It's Terry Frazier. She's a go-getter, isn't she? Amen. Yeah, but I don't know. She ain't done well with Anna, so I don't know. Yeah, she is. She is. Who raised her hand? Brother Ray. He's the same way with me. He's just kind of my right-hand guy. If I need something, I can call him. He's free. He don't do nothing. So he's always free. He's always free. Amen. Amen. And he's not back there. Oh, is he? There he is. Okay. And that's uh, and we'll stop right there because I want to do this every now and then. I want everybody to pick somebody out and say that person is an inspiration to me because that's encouraging to them. It's encouraging to that person to know that they've inspired somebody else. And I hopefully next time it might be a whole new list of folks that we might say, here's some folks that inspire me, and we need that. We need that. Colossians chapter 1.
I'd like to look tonight for a few minutes in uh, beginning in verse 13, the preeminent Christ. I had a little handout if you got one. Uh, did anybody not get one that needs one? Maybe a couple's got two and they could share one of them or something like that. I don't think I made, but 45. Oh, me of little faith. I made. Oh, you got some more back. There's some more back there in the media window if you want one. Okay. The preeminent Christ, and in this, I was going to do something next week because this really elevates Christ and we see his, that He is God. And in this, we see that Jesus, His sovereignty, and I was going to talk next Sunday night about His sovereignty. Well, I forgot we didn't have church next Sunday night, so in a couple of weeks, I'll come back and try to touch on that. And I want to talk about His sovereignty and how, and I'm going to talk a little bit about tying in Sovereignty and salvation. Calvinism and what we believe about that. How does God... You see, I believe in the sovereignty of God. I believe God can do whatever He wants to do. But I think there's... I I take it to the point there's some things that God is not going to force on us. That God gives us some free will, too, to make some decisions. To choose to receive Him, for example. And I've never really taught on that subject one night. I... I did a, I've done a two, two night study on it before, not here, but I thought I'd just kind of lump all that together. I just want to make sure that we kind of all understand that. But while I'm talking about this preeminence and Christ being God, I think we, it would be good to pause and just say, I want to talk to you about how Christ is involved in this salvation issue. Because to be honest, that will be a big issue whether it's in the Southern Baptist Convention or just in the church in the years to come. It really will. More and more of our young people are, are being trained in seminaries today to come out that, you know, you don't need to do much evangelism. God's decided who's going to be saved, who's not going to be saved. And, uh, you know, there's nothing really you and I can do about that. We just need to celebrate God, you know. And, and see, I, that's just so foreign from what I've been taught my whole life, you know. And so we're going to look at that. We're just going to talk about, I'll t- I'm going to bring out some great theologians of our day uh, that were Calvinistic or in their, in their beliefs uh, and those that weren't. For example, Adrian Rogers was not. Jerry Vines, who does our Sunday school equipment, sir? I just think that knowledge you just give us great tradition. Right, right. Well, and there are some that are Calvinistic that, that believe that they still have to do missions because God's decided who's going to get saved, but they don't know who they are, so they still got to go find them. I can live with that. I can live with that. I just can't live with it being uh, so fatalistic that God's decided everything, we're a bunch of robots. Sovereignty doesn't mean we're robots. Sovereignty doesn't mean that, that everything that happens, well, that was the will of God. Well, I think there's a lot of things that happens on the world today that's not the will of God. <laughs> there's not God's ideal, perfect will that He allows. But it's not His perfect will. It's not what He desires for us. And so, uh, but He allows it to happen that we may learn from it and learn to depend on Him. So anyway, I don't want to get into it all, but I do want to take some time and talk to you just about that subject and try to give you a little bit of the approach from both sides of that so that you see that. But uh, it'll be real clear to you when it's over what I believe. And then you can believe whatever you want to believe. But uh, I'm going to believe what the Bible says on that. And so the preeminent Christ, let's talk about that tonight, a few things about it. The first thing, the deliverance of Christ, verses 13 and 14. It's kind of where we left off uh, last week. Uh, our, uh, verse 13 says of Jesus Christ, it speaks of him, and it says, and he, del- he has delivered us from the... Now Paul, again, making this argument here of who is Christ. Remember I told you that in Colossae there was this, there was this belief that... Uh, there was this belief that... Uh, Christ was not fully God. Christ was not equal with God. And so Paul begins to take that on here in these verses. He begins to define who Christ is in verse 13. He's delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. I called it the deliverance of Christ. He's delivered us. 
He's delivered us from, first of all, the power of darkness. It talks about that right there, the, the power of darkness. What's the power of darkness? What do you think he's talking about, this power of darkness? Evil? Is it powerful in our lives? Is that powerful to a lost person? It's, it's what keeps a person addicted, isn't it? It's what keeps the person thinking about doing evil. Someone said, years ago, I don't remember who made the illustration. It may have been Adrian Rogers. I've listened to and read so much of his stuff. But uh, that every time we disobey God, it's like Satan who's trying to wrap us up and, and put us in bondage. It's like he takes a chain and he wraps it around us one time. And then we disobey. And if we don't deal with that chain, it stays there. If we don't repent, next time we disobey God, He wraps it around us again. The next time we disobey God, He wraps it around us again. Before long, that old chain, we're getting deeper and deeper and deeper in bondage to that which is dark. Which is a representation of hell and Satan himself. The Bible calls hell a place of eternal darkness. And so, and, and every time we disobey, that chain is wrapped around us. And before long, you know, when it's, when it's early on, when it's just a couple of loops around you, pretty easily you could step out of it. But boy, once it gets up above your waist, it gets harder and harder to get out of. And it becomes a power. In fact, the Bible refers to it sometimes as a... As, as a uh, uh, a, a, a fortress, if you will. Uh, it's like Satan takes up a, a fortress in your life, and he, he'll tell you, I have a right to be here. And we have to get to that place where we say, no, you don't have a right to be here. I'm giving this territory to God. And we have to expel him. And so he, here we see that he delivers us from the power of darkness uh, into the kingdom, into his kingdom, the son's kingdom. Uh, and, and so it's important that we understand that, that here it's talking about Jesus who's delivered us from the power of darkness, conveyed us into the love. And by the way, uh, that verse is used a number of times uh, over in Acts, later in Acts and other places where he talks about the whole purpose. He tells Paul the reason he saved him was that he then might take people and turn them from the darkness to the light. And that is the mission of of the church. The mission of the church is to turn people from darkness who are in bondage to this kingdom of darkness to the light. And what, what is the difference? What, what is the difference in this kingdom of darkness, how one feels in that, and how one feels in the kingdom of light? What's the difference in that feeling? Can anybody tell me? Can anybody testify to that? Bondage versus freedom. Right. Just a lack of peace isn't turmoil. It's like a, a ship that's on a, a, a stormy sea. One's heavy. Yeah. One's sad. One's full of joy. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And isn't it, there's a difference in the source of that joy or happiness. In the kingdom of darkness, that the source of that what you think is happiness is artificial. It might be drugs, it might be alcohol, it might be partying, it might be money, riches. Uh, it could be a lot of things that's creating this artificial joy. And, and here's how I know it's artificial. Because you may have it one night and it's gone the next day. The joy God gives us is not based upon an artificial stimulant. It's based upon an internal change. And it's not gone from one day to the next. Doesn't mean there aren't struggles, but it's an ongoing joy that comes from the Lord. Another thing it said there, it said that we've been redeemed. What does that mean? One more time, won't you ask, tell me what that means? Been saved, yes. 
But when you go to town, and you know, how many of you used to save green stamps? Remember the old green stamps? You had an envelope full of them, and you could go to town and do what with them? Redeem them. You could redeem them. And that means you could go to town and find out what they were worth. And you could get, you know, a loaf of bread or something with a bunch of green stamps. I don't know what you could get, but, but you could redeem them for something. And what Jesus did for us on the cross, when His blood was shed, He redeemed us. The word redeem means He paid for us. He bought our freedom. Therefore, Corinthians says, we are not our own we have been bought with a price. I'm going to tell you, that's not taught enough in our churches today. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your, in your body, which is the Lord's. Wow. That's a lot right there about who owns you who, who you, who you're to glorify, who you're to honor. Okay? So that's the deliverance that it speaks of. Verses 15 to 19, the deity of Christ. This is where we see that real, Paul really begins to make his argument about Christ. He's the image of the invisible God. What's that mean? <laughs> if you've seen him, you've seen God. Hello? Is that what that means? Huh? If you've seen him... You've seen God. He is God. It doesn't say if you've seen if you've seen Christ. He's the He's close. To, it doesn't say He's close to the image of God. It doesn't say you've seen the second view of God. It doesn't say you've seen a view of God. It says you have seen the He is the image of the invisible God. Not only is He that. He's the firstborn over all creation. A number of times, about five times in the Bible, it speaks about how that Christ created everything, and everything was created by Him and for Him. We're fixing to read it again right here. It says it in Revelation. It basically tells us that in Genesis. Uh, there's a number of places it talks about that, that whole theme right there of the fact that Christ created everything. Go back to Genesis. It says, uh, let us, what do you say in creation story? God said, let us create man in our image. Who's the us? Who's the our? Hello? Who is it? The Trinity. It's the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All were involved in the creation. But my Bible specifically says He created it. Jesus created it all. God is Spirit. He was empowering the creation. Jesus was the hands and the person that did it all. He spoke it into existence, the Bible says. And so uh, Paul is making the argument to them here. You don't, when you worship Jesus, he's not some lesser God. He's, some, he's not some semblance of God. He is the creator. So the deity of Christ here, it speaks of three things. Verse 15, the person of God is revealed. The person of God is revealed. The second thing, verses 16 and 17, the power of God is revealed. Look what it says, verse 16. It says, For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities and powers, all things were created through Him and for Him. That means... No matter what is out there, those strong angels, those demons that rebelled against God, any power is under the authority of God. Every, every principality was all created. Every mountain out there was created by Him. Everything that you've seen in heaven and earth. So the power of God, He spoke it all into existence, the Bible says. And number three, the purposes of God were revealed. Verse, uh, well, I didn't re read verse 17. Let me read verse 17. For He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. Remember I talked to you this about the other day. Consist, that means it continues on because of Him. Whether or not we have a world to live in next year is not because you've got an electric car. That's not going to determine whether we have a world next year. 
It's going to be because God decided we was going to have a world next year. God made that decision. And so that's part of that power of God. Verse 18 and 19 is the purposes of God that were revealed. Look what it says. And He's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and that in all things He may have preeminence. And that's where we get our, our title, our theme tonight, the preeminent Christ. He's the head of this new body. This new body. What is that? Hello, what is that? The church. This is the new body of Christ. Christ has gone back to heaven. Who's His hands and His feet now? Who is His mouth now? Us. That's who we are. And He is the head of it. He's the head of this church. And the moment He's not, there won't be a good spirit here. The moment He's not, He'll not be getting glory. And so we always have to be aware of that. He desires to be first. He is the head of this church. There's not room for two heads. I'm not the head of this church. Christ is the head of this church. He's the great shepherd. I'm just a little under-shepherd. I just get to be, a, I just get to be one of the ranchers on the big farm. <laughs> one of the shepherd men. So it says here that he, we need to keep him at the head. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should be dwell now there's a word there for us right there on all the fullness in him all the fullness should dwell fullness of what i mean this is a big verse for those who are doubting the inspiration of whether jesus is god in him all that there is about god you find it in him he's everything he's the trinity by that I mean that there's nothing in the Trinity that Christ does not have access to, does not have authority in, and is not part of who He is. Understand, there's not three gods. There's one God who's revealed Himself in three different ways. Someone said, I still don't fully understand the Trinity. Well, you may never fully understand it, but try to understand it this way. Like, for example, to me the greatest example is water. Water can be in liquid form. It can be in what? Ice is another form, and it can be in a third form, steam or gas. What a beautiful representation of God. What a beautiful representation of the Spirit. It's just one water, but you may see it or use it in three different ways. And that's the way the Trinity is. And for people who say that you can get saved here, and then you don't get the Holy Spirit, but somewhere down the road you get the Holy Ghost. That's just not true. If you got Jesus, you got everything there is about God. Now, if you're not letting Him have His way, if you're, if you're uh, uh, blocking Him, if you're suppressing the Holy Spirit in your life, that's something you need to deal with, sin in your life. But everything of God is available to us when we get saved. You don't get Jesus here and, God, and the rest of God somewhere else. This verse says, in Him is all. The fullness of God, okay? All right, so that's the deity of Christ. No, if you got God, you got that. If you got Jesus, you got all of that. Number three, the death of Christ. The death of Christ, verses 20 to 22. And by Him to reconcile all things to Himself. By Him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of His cross. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by the wicked works. And you know, isn't it amazing that he says, that's where you were alienated was in your mind. You know, when you get saved, this is one of those things that's got to get saved is your mind. To ever fully, to ever fully walk with God, you're going to get your mind right with God. You're going to get your mind washed by the Spirit of God. Because you'll never experience all the fullness of God until you get your mind right. Now, the Bible is so full. Uh, let this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus. And, and uh, you know, how we have to renew our mind, uh, how important that is, that we're going to be it, not be conformed to the world, but be, uh, be uh, how does it say it, uh, transformed by the renewing of your mind, you know. And that's what we need to happen, a transformation. It takes place. It starts in the mind you're thinking. It's not what you think with. It's what you think. 
It's, what, it's the area where you think, if you will. So it's not talking about your brain. It's talking about your mind. And that's that place where we wrestle between good and evil. We wrestle with what is right. We wrestle with what we are. The Bible says as a man thinks in his heart, which you could have said mind right there, as a mind thinks, so he'll become. It's what you think about. It's what you'll become. First place the devil attacks. That's right. He wants to attack your thinking. All right. So you were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. What's the word reconciled mean? Somebody tell me what that means. Restored. Made right. What? Okay. You were enemies with God. Now you've been brought back to God. Reconciled. Just like a husband and wife who might be fighting and the old pastor gets in there and gets bruises on his head and everything else, gets cussed at, talked about and everything else. But his whole objective is is to get them back together, that they might be reconciled. All right? And that's the plan of God. And so here he says that. Verse 22, let me read it. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. That's what reconciliation does. It makes you blameless, holy and blameless, and above reproach. What does blameless mean? Does that mean you never did anything wrong? What's blameless mean? Forgiven. Huh? Right. Somebody can't bring a charge against you before God. You're covered. It's been washed. It's been put under the blood. All right? And so now you're blameless, not because you had never done anything wrong, but because it's been washed in the blood. It, it, what was a fault is now gone. Okay? Cast in the depths of the sea to be remembered no more, the Bible says. And so uh, that's what reconciliation does. It brings you to that place where you are now above reproach. Above reproach, again, same thing. It just basically means that you've stayed confessed up and right with God. It means that no one can bring a charge against you now because you could say, yeah, I blew that. But God's got that now. I gave that to God, and He has forgiven that. And, uh, you know, as a minister or as a deacon, one of the things it talks about in the Bible is about us being above reproach. It is. It is. It's, a reproach would be created in us. It would be like a stain on us. It would be like a black eye because we've done something, and it's still active. It's not been dealt with. Above reproach is when you've gotten above that and you've hid that under the blood. You, you've taken that away. Okay? And that's where we're to live, not in reproach, but above reproach. You got that? And the blood is what does that. Okay. All right. How were we alienated? i got a couple things written on mine. I don't think I have it on yours. We're mentally alienated and morally alienated from God. All right. Number four, the demands of Christ. What are the demands? I just got two things here. First of all, verse 23, we must be loyal to Him. He does ask us to be loyal. Verse 23, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded, steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. So basically there, he talks about this faith that we have, that we've committed to when we got saved. If indeed you continue, he talks about how that this, this reconciliation has brought us to that place with rightness with God. And he says, now I want you to continue in that. I want you to be loyal to Him. And Paul is saying there, that's what it brings about. This reconciliation brings about a, a faithfulness to God. A second thing, verses 24 to 29, we must live for Him. And he talks about how to live for Him, beginning in verse 24. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you. Remember where Paul is? Who can tell me where Paul is when he's writing this? He's in prison. It's one of his prison epistles, right? In Rome. Some say Rome, some say another uh, Ephesus, but we'll, we'll, that's not important where. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of His body, 
which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the Word of God. Paul's just talking about his ministry and, the, and his willingness to, un, to enter into that ministry. He basically says two things. That we're going to undergo that affliction. We're going to undergo that when we identify with the cross. The cross... The cross brings you out. The cross is a sign of death. The cross is a sign of commitment. And when we identify with the cross, we're gonna all, we can all experience afflictions. Verse 26, The mystery which has been hidden from ages, from generations, but now has been revealed to His saints. What do you think he's talking about, the, mis- the mystery? Anybody have an idea? The mystery was the church, the church age. Uh, more than one place here in the New Testament, it talks about the church. The prophets of the Old Testament didn't see the, the church. They, did, they saw the second coming of Christ. Let me, let me explain it this way. Someone I heard explain it this way. It's almost like a prophet was sitting here looking at a vision for the future, and he saw a hill, and that hill was the first coming of Jesus Christ when he would come. And then right behind it, right behind it was a second hill. And sometimes they couldn't distinguish between what was the first coming or what was the second coming. They just saw these different stories about the coming of the Lord. And another thing they didn't see, they didn't see the valley between the two hills, which is the church, the church age. And that's what he's talking about here. Paul's talking about the calling, the, the ministry The purpose of the church. The church was one of those mysteries. God even, it even, he even talked about how the angels were amazed to look into these mysterious things, to look into why Christ would come and die on the cross and and what was his purpose. And and you can imagine that John 17 ministerial prayer, how they must have thought about his purpose in life and death. So he's challenging us here to understand that, that, that this was a mystery. And it goes on and says, here's what it says, verse 27. To them God willed to make known what are the riches to them. And by the way, he's revealed it, it says, to his saints. That's the church. That's what he's talking about. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. The church. Okay, Paul is talking about the Old Testament prophets didn't see it. They, they understood these comings of Jesus. Because, you know, in, in the Old Testament, sometimes it talks about the coming of Jesus. It talks about Jesus' second coming, right? And sometimes it's talking about His first coming. Well, you can understand, they just saw the coming of the Lord. And it wasn't clear to them the difference between the first coming and the second coming. And even though there were messages like in Isaiah, when Isaiah said of Jesus when he came that he'd be a a light to the Gentiles, right? Well, that's why he came. He came and died on that cross to be a light to the Gentiles. That was in the book of Isaiah. But here, this fully understanding the two separate comings and the, the birth of the church, you and I and what's going on right now in the world, was a mystery but he's saying God has now made that clear okay and in verse 27 to them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you the hope of glory they never understand that man the Old Testament never understood Christ in you even though in Jeremiah it said there's going to be one who's going to come one day that's going to come and and he how did it say it Somebody maybe help me here. I just I thought about it and, and how it said it. But he talked about the time that would come that uh, he would create a new covenant. He talked about the old covenant, and then he talked about the time of a new covenant coming. Well, that's the church. That's the covenant of Jesus' blood that purchased the church. And so even Jeremiah talked about that, but it, it was almost like he, you can imagine, he was almost like he was out of his head. You can imagine they must. Well, he was. He was in the spirit. 
And God was revealing to him this new covenant. That's who you and I are a part of. This new covenant by the blood. Not by keeping the law, but a covenant of grace. All right? And so, uh, verses 28, let me read on down. We're just finishing this chapter here. Uh, Verse 28, Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. What's perfect mean? Complete, mature, a finished work. You see, when Jesus comes back, He wants to present us finished. Remember what the the salvation is? He justified us. He saved us. Right now, He is sanctifying us. He is setting us apart from the world. But one day, the third part is glorification. And glorification, He's going to change us. And we're going to be completed. He's going to be, we're going to be completed in Christ. And when He comes back, the Bible says in Corinthians, we'll be changed, we'll be made like Him. Wow. What a great day. But that's what God wants to do, is He's in the process of completing us. Could I ask you a question? Are you... Is God working on you? Is God working? Can you look back and say, I'm not near the person I should be, but thank God I'm not what I was a couple of years ago? We ought to be able to say that. If you can't say that, if you're moving in the wrong direction, something's not right in your life. Either you're not saved or you're deeply backslidden on God. Okay? We ought to all be able to look and say, yeah, I'm, I still got a long ways to go, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. Amen? And so that's what God's doing. Verse 29, To this end I also stri- labor and striving according to His working, which works in me mightily, Paul says. Paul talks about His working in him mightily. Wow. Paul basically is saying here we... We should identify with his message, his ministry, his mission for the church. And that mission is to mature people in Christ. Last there, closing, I just gave you some different titles of Jesus Christ we learned today. First of all, in verse 15, we learned he was God. We learned Jesus is God. Verse 16, we learned he's the creator. Verse 17a, we learned He's the ruler. Not only did He create it, He rules over His creation. Verse 17b, He's a sustainer. In other words, He keeps it all going. Verse 18, we learned He's the head of the church. How big is the church? Anybody have an idea? There's what? How many, how many billion people? Is it 8 billion people in the world today? Hmm? About 8, 8 billion people in the world today. And a good number of those are a part of the church. Depends on where you draw the circle. <laughs> you know, it's how far, how far, how big of a circle do you include people in that? There's probably some you might include, I might not include. <laughs> and there might be some that you wouldn't include that I would include, okay? But there's a pretty good many people. Let's just say a round figure there. Let's just say, I think we can maybe agree that maybe a billion of those people are Christians, born again Christians. Maybe. Maybe. I wouldn't guarantee. He's the head of that. And last of all, verse 20, he's the Savior. He's the Savior. There's no one else that could save you. There's no one else qualified. No one else cares enough. No one else is willing to pay the price. No one else knows how to pay the price. No one else is capable of paying the price. Are willing to pay the price. That word Savior means He's the one that saves us. Wasn't that good? Good for a few verses? Let's stand and we'll be dismissed tonight. close with a word of prayer. Dale, dismiss us, please, sir.